It was the very beginning of the year 1912. A giant chunk of ice broke off a glacier in southwest Greenland. The ice was made up of the snow that had fallen about 100,000 years before the event. That was the time when mammoths were still roaming the planet. The iceberg started its journey. It was a huge thing, more than 1,700 feet long. It weighed around 75 million tons. It was also a very peaceful chunk of ice. It steered clear of ships and busy transport routes, not that there were many in the place where the iceberg was born. And then, it somehow floated much further to the south than other bergs did. Our iceberg was lucky. Others melt long before they get to these latitudes. Out of 15,000 to 30,000 icebergs that drift away from Greenland's glaciers, only 1% ever makes it all the way to the Atlantic. That's why it's so amazing that in April, our iceberg The Traveler was already more than 5,000 miles away from the Arctic Circle. Even after melting into the water for months, this block of ice still weighed an impressive 1.5 million tons. It's almost twice as much as the Golden Gate Bridge. The iceberg's top part was towering over the surface of the ocean for more than 100 feet. And still, if you noticed it floating next to your ocean liner, it would have looked harmless, but only at first glance. Like only a tiny part of a jumbo piece of ice. The largest part of any iceberg is always hidden under the surface. A mere one-tenth is normally visible above the water. And the berg we're talking about wasn't an exception. Several days before our iceberg made it to the Atlantic Ocean, a magnificent ship left port. It was a luxurious steamship carrying more than 3,000 passengers and crew members. At that time, it was the largest ship ever built. The liner was called the Titanic. It was considered unsinkable. At the very beginning of its journey, it nearly collided with the steamship New York. Luckily, the Titanic managed to pass by the other vessel with a couple of feet to spare. The people crowding the liner's decks let out a collective sigh of relief. Little did they know what was awaiting them in the nearest future. Meanwhile, the iceberg was approaching the area the Titanic was going to cross on its way to New York. It happened on April 14th, when the ship was in the North Atlantic Ocean, 370 miles away from Newfoundland. At about 11.40 p.m., people who were still awake on board the Titanic toppled down, pushed over by some mysterious and powerful force. Those who had already gone to bed got catapulted to the floor. Both the passengers and crew members were screaming, panicky, and confused. Just minutes before the commotion started, an iceberg had appeared right in front of the ship. It was our wandering iceberg. Why hadn't the crew noticed it earlier? There might have been several reasons. I'll tell you about them a bit later. Anyway, once the liner collided with a huge chunk of ice, it was doomed. Unable to divert its course, the ship ruptured at least five of its hull compartments. They started to fill with water with alarming speed. The Titanic's compartments weren't capped at the top. That's why the water spilled over and started to flood each succeeding one. The front of the ship began to sink, causing the back part to lift vertically into the air. And then, with a deafening roar, the liner broke in half. The rest is history. But few people know what happened to the iceberg after the ship had hit it. It gets us back to the question of why no one had spotted the floating ice mountain until it was too late. Let's track the events of that fateful day. At around 6 p.m., Captain Smith finally decides to change the Titanic's course. He's been receiving iceberg warnings throughout the entire day. The ship starts to head further to the south, but the speed remains the same. At 9.40 p.m., another ship informs Titanic about a vast ice field packed with icebergs. Unfortunately, this message never reaches the liner's bridge. At about 11 p.m., yet another steamship radios Titanic. They say the ice has surrounded them, making their ship stop. This message also gets ignored. Meanwhile, most of the passengers on the luxury liner have already retired to their rooms. At 11.35... The sailors in Titanic's crow's nest notice the iceberg. They ring the bell three times, which means something's ahead. 
Then they call the bridge. The engines get reversed, and the doors to the supposedly watertight compartments close. Just five minutes later, the huge liner's starboard side collides with the iceberg. The mailroom begins to fill with water. Soon other reports come. They don't sound encouraging. At least five other compartments are flooded. It becomes clear Titanic has just a few hours before it sinks. The night was exceptionally calm, with no moonlight, no wind, and no waves. And since the waves weren't breaking against the iceberg, it was difficult to perceive the giant. But there's also a theory that what sank Titanic was a black bird. If you had to draw an iceberg, I bet it would be a white, towering chunk of ice covered with snow. But those who have visited Antarctica know that icebergs come in millions of hues. They can be multicolored, patterned, or striped like candies. Icebergs can also be black. There are two ways such an unusually colored shard of ice can form. First, the ice might be extremely pure, with no air bubbles or cracks whatsoever. In this case, there's nothing to scatter the light. The iceberg will absorb it all and look black. Or an erupting volcano can cover a glacier with volcanic ash. Then the ice that breaks off this glacier will be dark-colored too. Experts don't know the true reason why Titanic's iceberg looks so dark, or whether it was really the case. But one of the sailors who was in the crow's nest testified the ice was black. The other said it was either gray or dark gray. There's nothing exciting or mysterious about the so-called black bergs. They're icebergs that roll over after their top part is melted, which changes the weight distribution. If their lower part is smooth enough to absorb light, they look dark. Plus, they usually aren't exposed to the air long enough for the white frost to build up. But let's say this theory is wrong, and the iceberg wasn't actually black. And still, the only reason why you see things is because light gets reflected from them. The less light there is, the less likely you are to notice something. The ocean surface will always reflect the moon and starlight. But an irregularly shaped, almost vertical iceberg will have fewer chances of doing so. That's why it'll look almost black against the glimmering water surface. At night, icebergs can be rather difficult to detect without a radar. In any case, our iceberg wasn't noticed in time. Titanic crashed into it and sank. End of story? Apparently not. On April 15th, the German ocean liner SS Prinz Albert was sailing through the North Atlantic. It was traveling a few miles away from the place where Titanic had sunk several hours before. The German ship's chief steward, who hadn't learned about the disaster yet, saw an iceberg. What drew his attention was a fairly large streak of red paint going along the iceberg's base. Surprised, the man took a photo of his discovery. He thought the paint meant a ship hit the iceberg during the past 12 hours. The next person who saw the infamous chunk of ice and took its photo was the captain of the vessel used to lay deep-sea telecommunications cables. The ship was sent to help in the area where Titanic had sunk. The captain later claimed the iceberg he had seen had been the only one in that area. Plus, the red paint. It wasn't difficult to connect the dots. In 2015, one of these photos was sold at auction for more than $32,000. And still, experts are unsure whether the image really shows the infamous block of ice. It might be another innocent iceberg that was floating nearby at that time. A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell 100,000 years ago. Researchers use computer modeling to figure out its origin. 
they used data from 1912 and added some new information about winds and ocean currents. They concluded that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long, and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. Some people believe it was a supermoon that caused the Titanic to sink. That night, there was a rare lunar event. It hadn't happened for 1,400 years. In normal conditions, the iceberg wouldn't have traveled so far south without melting and losing the largest part of its mass. But the supermoon could have been the reason for an unusually high tide that pulled the iceberg away from the glacier way faster than usual. There's a specific type of bacteria that slowly consumes the remains of the Titanic. Salt corrosion, ocean currents, freezing temperatures, plus this rust-eating microorganism might consume the entire wreckage. American actress Dorothy Gibson was aboard the Titanic. She survived, and when she arrived in New York, she started filming a movie called Saved from the Titanic almost right away. The movie was released only a month after the Titanic sank, and in the movie, she even wore the same shoes and clothes she had during the actual disaster. The movie was a big success at that time, but the only known copy was destroyed in a fire. 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novella called Futility had been published, and it seemed to have predicted the whole event. The plot centered around a fictional ship called the Titan that sank during its voyage. The Titan was almost the same size as Titanic, and they both went to the bottom in April. The reason was hitting an iceberg, too. Both the real and fictional ships were described as unsinkable, and both of them had the legally required number of lifeboats, which, as it turned out later, were nowhere near enough. We've seen it in the movie, but there were some real-life love stories happening on the Titanic, too. Thirteen couples even took a trip on the Titanic as part of their honeymoon. One of the couples owned Macy's department store in New York. Once it became clear the Titanic was rapidly sinking, the woman refused to go into a lifeboat without her husband. But he didn't want to join her while there were still women and children who he thought had to go first. Then his wife gave her coat to her maid. She insisted that the maid should get into the lifeboat, and she wanted her to be warm. As for the woman herself, she decided to stay with her husband till the end. Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. People knew little about her, but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century when a group of locals accidentally came across it. They disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. 
The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. The pressure was so powerful, it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. How come the crew members didn't have binoculars? It would have surely helped them spot the iceberg on time and maybe even avoid the disaster. But the binoculars on the Titanic were locked in a storage cabinet. Only one crew member had the key, and he had been transferred off the ship right before it set sail. He later said he hadn't remembered to hand over the key. But even without the binoculars, the ship might have had some time to change course and avoid the collision if the crew had gotten some warning. But that's the thing. Someone did warn them. About an hour before the incident, a ship that was relatively close to Titanic, the SS Californian, sent a message to inform them it had stopped because of dense ice field. But the warning never got to the Titanic's captain. Some experts say it was because the radio operator didn't think it was that urgent. And later, the SS Californian said they didn't get a call for help from the Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Some say the crew on the Titanic couldn't spot the iceberg on time because of an optical illusion. Atmospheric conditions that night probably caused super-refraction, which could have camouflaged the berg. After all, no one actually saw the iceberg until it was too close to the ship to somehow avoid the crash. Not even a whole minute passed between the moment they saw the iceberg and the collision. It was only 37 seconds, and it took Titanic 2 hours and 40 minutes to disappear below the ocean's waves. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Over a century ago, the Titanic struck an iceberg and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Of the 2,240 people on board, only around 700 survived. Since then, the tragedy has been the subject of endless movies, documentaries, and books. And though we've learned a lot about the ship and many of the people on board, we hardly know anything about the iceberg responsible for the catastrophe, especially anything concerning its size. But maybe we can find some clues. The Titanic was constructed by the White Star Line as part of its new fleet of passenger liners. At the time, it was the largest ship ever built, and it lived up to its name. The ship was 883 feet long, equal to two and a half soccer fields placed end to end, and 175 feet tall, which is close to 10 giraffes standing on top of one another. From the waterline to the deck alone, the boat was 60 feet high. That's close to the height of a four-story building. The Titanic was big enough to have veranda cafes, a restaurant, a reading and writing room, a Turkish bath, a gym, and squash courts. There was even space for a swimming pool. The liner could carry a total of 3,300 people, including 2,435 passengers and 900 crew members. Although luxury was important, safety was paramount. The Titanic had been designed to have 16 watertight compartments below its deck. If the ship's hull was somehow compromised in an accident, up to four of these compartments could take on the water, while the remaining 12 would keep the ship afloat. Philip Franklin, vice president of the White Star Line, said this was what made the ship truly remarkable. It's believed that the man said, There is no danger the Titanic will sink. 
The boat is unsinkable, and nothing but inconvenience will be suffered by the passengers. He was so very wrong. The ship left England for its first and last voyage on April 10, 1912. And all it took was a single iceberg to bring that mighty vessel down. Icebergs are fascinating. They are formed during a process called calving, when large chunks of freshwater ice break free from glaciers and float away into open water. They eventually melt away and disappear. In the Northern Hemisphere, the majority of these icebergs come from Greenland. In the South, they come from Antarctica. What you see on top of the water is only a small portion of an iceberg. This is just the tip. Most of it, up to 90%, is hidden under the water. Only when you examine pictures of the entire thing can you truly appreciate how massive icebergs are. It's the part of the iceberg you can't see that is often the most dangerous. Beneath the waves, it can have jagged edges in random places. A ship can easily get too close without realizing it, resulting in serious damage to the bottom of the boat. And it's not just big icebergs you have to watch out for. Smaller ones, which are more difficult to spot, can prove to be just as dangerous. A growler, for example, is under 7 feet long, with just a bit more than 3 feet showing above the water. And a slightly larger bergy bit is less than 15 feet in size. The dangers of icebergs were well known when the Titanic set sail. In 1901, the Islander was traveling through the inside passage to Alaska. It collided with an iceberg and sank immediately. Luckily, 138 of the 178 people on board made it to safety. Back then, there wasn't any special equipment for detecting icebergs. The best tool was your eyes. From a special vantage point above the ship called the crow's nest, two members of the crew had to stare out over the ocean and watch for potential hazards. The crow's nest was located at the front of the ship, 49 feet above the deck. It was attached to the mast. From this height, a person had a good view of the ocean. If they saw anything suspicious, they could ring a large bell to sound the alarm. After that, they could call from a special telephone to warn the captain of any danger. But imagine what a horrible job this would have been, especially on the night the Titanic sank. The crow's nest wasn't a warm and cozy room surrounded by windows. Instead, it was a large open tub exposed to the elements. On April 14, 1912, the air temperature was around 39 degrees Fahrenheit, which is close to freezing. With the ship moving at about 23 knots, more than 26 miles per hour, the sailors must have felt that frigid cold air pressing against any exposed skin. The only good thing about the job was that the shift only lasted two hours. Frederick Fleet was the sailor who actually spotted the iceberg that sank the Titanic. He was up in the crow's nest, working with Reginald Lee at the time. Fleet kept track of the left side of the ship, while Lee scanned the right. It was 10 p.m. when the two men started their shift. They had already been warned about the possibility of ice. But when you're cold and it's dark, it might feel like an impossible task. Even worse, the two men didn't even have binoculars to make the job any easier. Fleet would later insist that having binoculars would have prevented the tragedy. With about 20 minutes remaining on the job, the sailors noticed the iceberg. Fleet rang the bell, once, twice, and again. He then called up to the bridge to inform the crew. At first, the call seemed to come in the nick of time. The ship's engines reversed, and the massive ocean liner managed to turn. It wasn't enough to miss the iceberg, though. Ice showered down onto the ship's deck. The iceberg tore through the hull, and water flooded in. Two hours and 40 minutes later, the Titanic was gone. And here we have clue number one. The iceberg was big enough to be spotted with the unaided eye in the dark of the night without any binoculars. It was also tall enough for bits of ice to fall down onto the ship's deck. Since this all took place long before social media and smartphones, nobody on board would have been taking photos or videos at the time. So of course, we don't have any footage of the actual iceberg. But there are photos of the possible iceberg from later that day. The SS Prinz Adalbert was sailing near the area on the morning of April 15, 1912. The steward on the ship had not yet heard about what had happened to the Titanic, 
But when he spotted an iceberg floating by, he was compelled to photograph it. Why? There was a line of red paint along the bottom of the iceberg, indicating that it had likely collided with a ship sometime within the previous 12 hours. A second photo was taken from a ship called the Minia, which was sent into the area to look for debris from the collision. Captain de Carteret said that among the wreckage, he had seen only one iceberg. He also noticed a streak of red paint on it. From the photos and witness accounts, newspaper reports estimated the iceberg to be 50 to 100 feet high and 200 to 400 feet long. That's clue number two. The iceberg that hit the Titanic probably started its ocean journey from Greenland's coast, heading past the Baffin Bay to the Davis Strait. From here, it must have slipped through the Labrador Sea and finally reached the Atlantic. And that, in itself, is pretty impressive. The glaciers in Greenland create between 15,000 to 30,000 icebergs each year. Some small, some big. Of these, a mere 1% will actually make it to the Atlantic. The others simply melt along the way. We know that the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean, where the sinking took place, was around 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's below freezing. For humans, this could cause frostbite or hypothermia. But that temperature is actually warm for an iceberg. Most would only last two to three years in the North Atlantic, slowly melting into the warmer water. Based on this, it's likely that the Titanic's iceberg left Greenland in 1910 or 1911 and was fully melted by late 1912 or 1913. But since it did make it to the Atlantic and managed to cause significant damage to the ship, we have clue number three. We will never know for certain the size of the iceberg from that day, but we do know that it definitely wasn't a growler or a bergy bit. Both those types of icebergs are much too small. And if the ice was indeed scattered across the deck during the collision, the iceberg must have been a little taller than 60 feet. The newspaper estimates are probably as close as we're going to get. The iceberg that took down the Titanic was indeed a formidable one. And icebergs are still a threat. As recently as 2007, the cruise ship Explorer struck one and sank in Antarctica's Weddell Sea. Luckily, everybody survived. The International Ice Patrol was created in 1914 following the Titanic's sinking. The organization is still in operation today, made up of representatives from several countries. Using airplanes and radar, the patrol locates and tracks larger icebergs, making the information available to anyone who needs it and preventing more ocean tragedies in the process.